Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Well, Shabbat Shalom. And because it's, it's Mother's Day tomorrow, in honor of that, I want to speak today on uh, Proverbs, Mishle, Proverbs 31. Uh, then the Bible's picture uh, of a virtuous woman, a virtuous wife. Uh, and I want to acknowledge our gratitude today, as I mentioned, uh, for all the mothers here uh, and, and uh, the mothers of all the children. Uh, and at the same time, I want to take a broader emphasis today uh, to honor not just the mothers, uh, but all the women uh, of EC, regardless of whether you're married or single, uh, young or old, uh, with children or without children. And I want us to look at, at the uh, biblical Messiah-centered womanhood today. Uh, I want to do that through the lens of Proverbs 31. Uh, and this is especially apropos, uh, given the um, rapid, uh, anti-biblical, radical shift in our culture concerning women and relationships between men and women today. So people ask today, what does it even mean uh, to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? Uh, and are there even distinctions between the two in any way? You know, in God's design, uh, uh, is God's design for men and women, is it unique in any way? Uh, these are huge questions, and how we answer them has tremendous consequences. Uh, here's what uh, Pastor John Piper says, put this on the overhead. He says this, uh, the tendency today is to stress the equality of men and women by minimizing the unique significance of our maleness and femaleness. But this de depreciation of male and female personhood is a great loss. It's taking a tremendous toll on generations of young men and women who don't know what it means to be a man or to be a woman. The confusion over the meaning of sexual personhood today is epidemic. And the consequences of this confusion isn't a free and happy harmony among gender-free persons, living on the basis of abstract competencies. No, rather the consequence is more divorce, more homosexuality, more sexual abuse, uh, more promiscuity, more social awkwardness, more emotional distress and suicide that come all come with the loss of God-given identity. Now, such a loss of God-given identity obviously has huge ramifications for understanding what happens when a man and a woman come together in marriage. Uh, or do we even have to have a man and a woman uh, anymore to come together in order to have a marriage? Uh, these are questions that are at the core of so much confusion in our culture today. Uh, and it even has crept into the body of Messiah, sadly. So it's well worth our time today to look at biblical womanhood uh, as we celebrate Mother's Day. So I want to ask, how does the gospel, how does the life, death, death and resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah, how does it uniquely uh, attribute value and honor and beauty to women? Uh, and what does the cross of Messiah uniquely enable women to do in this world? And that brings us to the, the climax of the entire book of Proverbs, the very end of it, the last chapter, uh, and, and, the, and, and the whole uh, book, of, book of Wisdom, the book of Proverbs is the book of Wisdom. And Proverbs 31 was a picture of a woman of wisdom. So let's read together Proverbs 31, beginning in verse 10, verses 10 to 31. Who can find a virtuous wife? For her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts in her. And he'll, so he'll have no lack of gain. She does him good, never evil, all the days of her life. She seeks out wool and flax, and her hands work willingly. She's like a merchant ship. Uh, she brings her food from afar. She rises while he yet that still night, and provides food for her household and a portion for her maidservants. She considers a field and buys it. And from her profits, of the, from this field, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and, and strengthens her arms. She perceives that her merchandise is good. Her lamp doesn't go out by night. She stretches out her hands so that this staff, her hands support the spindle. She extends her hands to the poor. Yes, she reaches out her hands to the needy. 
She's unafraid of snow for her household, for all her house is clothed with scarlet wool. She makes tapestry for herself, her clothing is linen, fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them, supplies sashes to the peddlers, the merchants. Strength and honor are her raiment, her clothing. Uh, she, and and uh, she shall rejoice in the time to come. She opens her, her mouth with tachma, with wisdom. And on her tongue is the lesson or the law of, of, of chesed, of kindness. She watches over the ways of her household and does not eat of the bread of idleness or laziness. Her children, they rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her, saying, many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful. Beauty is passing. But a woman who has a direct Hashemayim, who fears the Lord, she should be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands, that her works praise her in the gates. This is a picture here of the perfect woman. There's no mention of any imperfections here. In Proverbs 31, we read about how godly this woman is, uh, how wise she is, what a wonderful wife she is, uh, uh, how she's an amazing woman. Uh, let's look at the, all the things it says about her. She, she's a homemaker, a great cook. Uh, she makes her own clothes for herself and her children. Uh, she gets up before everybody else in the house. Uh, she goes to bed after everybody else has gone to bed. Uh, she's strong. She's humble. She's confident. She's a servant. She's also a leader. She's an entrepreneur. Uh, she, she makes business deals. She buys land. Uh, she loves and she cares for the poor. This is Wonder Woman. <laughs> and as a result, women can read this text and instead of you being encouraged, you become discouraged. You say to yourself, I can never be like that. Or are you single men out there? You, know, you read this text and you say, I've got to find a wife just like that, who's perfect in every way. Or you married men, they think, why isn't my wife perfect like that? <laughs> And I'm going to suggest that these are all unhealthy responses to this ideal picture of womanhood in the Word of God. And this is where I want us to realize that we have this ideal, perfect picture of a woman here for a reason. The whole point in the book of Proverbs is ultimately to point us to Messiah and the wisdom that can only be found in Him. Indeed, in 1 Corinthians, Paul says Messiah is our wisdom. So what we have here in, in Proverbs 31 is a picture of a woman who perfectly displays the wisdom of God in her womanhood. And it should neither discourage us nor deceive us with these overly lofty ideals. But in Yeshua, we find a perfect man, a, a man who perfectly displays the wisdom of God. And, and we as Yeshua followers, we don't say, when we, when we look at Yeshua, we don't say, I'm just so discouraged by Yeshua's perfection. No, we say the opposite. Uh, we're encouraged by the perfection of Yeshua that we see of him in the scriptures. <laughs> are you men, are we men who follow Yeshua? We don't look at him and get discouraged. We don't say, oh, I'll never be like him. You single women who follow Yeshua, uh, you don't say, I've got to find a husband who's perfect, just like Yeshua. But you married women who are Yeshua followers here today, you don't say, my husband must be perfect, just like Yeshua in every way. No, instead we look at Yeshua and we say, he's the perfect picture of the wisdom of God embodied within a man. And we look at him uh, and, we want to, and we want to look like him more and more for our good and for his glory. And so in the same way, I want to invite you today to read Proverbs 3.1. Uh, it's a picture of a woman who reflects God's wisdom. And in doing so, all you women here at Etzchayim, this passage is inviting you uh, to, uh, to, to long to look more and more like her uh, as you grow into the image of Messiah, to whom this picture is ultimately pointing all of us. Uh, and you men, uh, live, I want to encourage you and, and exhort you, uh, and challenge you to live, to serve and love and to help the women in your life uh, to grow more and more into Messiah's image in the ways reflected here, we're going to look at it in Proverbs 31. And so as we, as we prepare to, to dive into this text, 
um, amidst a very confused culture that we live in, especially when it comes to womanhood, uh, in a world where what it means to be a woman uh, is being twisted and cheapened and perverted and distorted uh, and redefined in every, at every turn, I want to encourage every woman here, based on the word of God, to be and become Messiah-like women of God. I want this text to inspire you to become more and more like Messiah in your life. Uh, with a clear and unique picture here in Proverbs 31 of a woman of one who lives like, who's like Messiah. And so as you go through this text, uh, if you're convicted, oh, I have so much to grow in this area. I, I fall so short. I'll never be like that. Or, or I've messed up so much already. I want to remind you. The one you trusted in Yeshua, the mercy of God covers your past. For every woman in this woman in this room, every woman hearing my voice later on, if you're trusting in Yeshua, if you're abiding in Him, know that the mercy of God covers your past. Romans 8, verse 1, very famous verse. Therefore, therefore, there's now no condemnation for those who are in Messiah Yeshua. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Messiah Yeshua from the law of sin and death. So please know, whatever you may have done in your past, in Messiah your sins are forgiven. Do not let guilt over your past keep you from becoming the women of God today that He has designed you to be. Because you are a new creation in Messiah, right? 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if anyone is in Messiah, he's a new creation. All the old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Which leads, you to, leads to my second exhortation to the, to the women of Messiah all across this room. You may be tempted to think, I can never be like this woman in Proverbs 31. And that's the beauty of what I want to call you to when it comes to the cross. Yes, in and of yourself, you can't be uh, a Messiah-like woman perfectly. But I want to encourage you and remind you there's power in the cross. There's power in the blood. Yeshua has defeated sin. Uh, he has conquered sin. He has risen from the grave. And he has set his spirit within you. He has filled you with his very spirit to enable you to live the life he's created you to be. Uh, as one led by God and loved by God. So know that the presence of God empowers your presence. God is with you, he's living within you, and he's enabling you to experience and live the life he's designed for you as his child, adopted into his family. So he's not, he's not only saved you by his mercy, but he's also filled you with his presence, with the spirit of Messiah, that you may grow more and more into his image day by day. Which leads to my last exhortation uh, to encourage you. The hope of God guarantees not only your present, but your future. Do not believe the, the lie of the enemy that says, oh, there's no hope for me to become this kind of godly woman, or this godly person in general. No, just the opposite. Based on the resurrection of Messiah, there's absolute guaranteed hope for you to become the kind of person in the Lord that he's created you to be. Because the Lord is conforming you to be the child of God that he has created you from eternity to be. So lean on his grace, grow in his grace, trust in his grace to mold your character and your attitude uh, and your speech and your actions and your heart's desires and intentions. Uh, so if this is a very confused culture, I'm gonna call every woman here today uh, to become Messiah-like woman of God. And I'm gonna call the married men who are here today uh, to love and to nurture a Messiah-like wife. This isn't just a day for us to honor wives and mothers. It's also a reminder that we husbands have been commanded to daily love and honor our wives. Look at 1 Peter 3, verse 7. You husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, uh, as a weaker vessel, since she's a woman, and grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers won't be hindered. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives. How? As Messiah loved the holy congregation and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, 
having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present her to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives. Men, did you catch that? The Bible commands us to honor our wives and to love them like Messiah loved the Holy Congregation, his congregation. Well, how does Messiah love his, his ecclesia, his congregation? He lays down his life for her so that she might be pure and holy and without blemish. In the same way, we husbands are to love our wives and to lay down our lives for her so that she might become holy and pure and spotless and without blemish. Husbands, love your wife, lay down your life for your wife, in such a way that she becomes a Messiah-like woman. Love her, nurture her toward that end. Husbands, as married men, you are responsible before God for your wife's growth in Messiah-likeness. And this is our God-given responsibility as husbands, to love and nurture our wives. So I want this word today to be a charge to you to recommit your life, you husbands, to serving your wife, so that she might grow into the likeness of Yeshua. Love her, honor her, serve her, pray for her, build her up, encourage her, to grow more and more to the likeness of Messiah, to experience all that Messiah has bought for her on the cross. That's the call to married men today. Now, very interestingly, if you carefully study this text uh, and the whole context of, of Proverbs 31, the primary audience of this proverb is not women. And the primary audience of this proverb is not married men. Actually, the primary audience is written to single men. Look at the first, first, first two verses of Proverbs 31. The words of King Lemuel, an oracle his mother taught him. Listen, my son. Listen, son of my womb. Listen, my son, uh, to an, an, the answer to my prayers. And then King Lemuel's mother begins to address the, the way he's supposed to approach women uh, as he's looking for a wife. And she warns him, you know, the, war, the wrong kind of wife, the wrong kind of woman will ruin you. And by the way, we see this theme throughout the whole book of Proverbs. So uh, here, we'll put this in the overhead. Here are some examples of warnings throughout the whole book of Proverbs. Uh, you see a warning against the adulterous woman, Proverbs 7. The unfaithful woman, Proverbs 2 and 30. The woman who neglects her family, Proverbs 7. The woman who, who bankrupts her family, Proverbs 6. Uh, the contentious woman, who's like a constant dripping on a day of steady rain, Proverbs 27. Look at Proverbs 25, 24. It's better to live up in the corner of the rooftop, of the housetop, than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. The book of Proverbs even warns against a beautiful woman who lacks wisdom. Look at Proverbs 11, 22. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. And then at the very end of the book of Proverbs, we get to our passage, where a mother says to her son, Proverbs 31, verse 10, an excellent wife, who can find? She's directing him what to look for in a wife. So the message of Proverbs 31 for single men is this. Pray for and seek out a Messiah-like, godly wife. Pray for this. So today I'm going to call all single men in this room to pray for a godly, Messiah-like wife. Look at Proverbs 19, verse 14. House and wealth are inherited from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. Ask God for a wise, Messiah-like, godly wife. And if you're here today, and if you're a single man of marriageable age, and you're able to support a family, take the initiative and seek out a godly wife. Resist the ever-present trend and temptation in our day to prolong your adolescence into your 30s. Stop playing video games and seek out a godly wife. Seek out a godly woman's father's permission to court her. And once you have her father's permission, ask her out. Take the initiative. 
And if she says no, make it as easy on her as possible. Humbly bow out uh, and seek a wife elsewhere. And when you seek a wife, stop seeking after what the world tells you you're supposed to seek after. Seek after what the Word of God tells you to seek after. Which is very different from what the world says. What, what the world says is important in a wife. Proverbs 31 is actually aimed at single brothers. So it's time, whether today, whether you're male or female, uh, single or married, let us praise godly women as we promote Messiah-like women in our midst. Look at Proverbs 31, 30. A woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. And when you praise women for, for the grace and goodness and, and wisdom of Yeshua that you see within them, who are you ultimately praising? You're praising Yeshua himself, the Lord. The Lord who's molding them by his mercy for his majesty into his image, the image of Messiah. So let's praise and honor the godly women of EC today as you promote Messiah likeness in all women. Uh, and with all the, the gender and role confusion in our culture today about what it means to be a woman created in the image of God, we want to focus today on the beauty of God's design for women. Uh, and younger women need older women as mentors in their lives to help them in these areas, to encourage them towards more and more uh, Messiah likeness. And every woman need, needs men in their lives, especially husbands and fathers, speaking truth uh, and showing love. So with all this backdrop, uh, what then are the characteristics of a Messiah like woman that the Word of God calls us to promote? Women, what does the Word of God call you to be and to become? Husbands, what does the Word of God call you to nourish in your wife? Single men, what does the Word of God call you to seek out for a wife, in a wife? And the answer that Proverbs 31 gives us is unique because in the original Hebrew, it's actually an acrostic. Each of the 22 verses of Hebrews, of Proverbs 31, 10 to 31, uh, begins with a sequential letter of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, beginning with Aleph in verse 10 and ending in Tav in verse 31. It's written in this way to make it easier to memorize. So in keeping with this theme, what I want us to do today is to give you my own acrostic uh, as a way to analyze this text. Now don't worry, I'm not going to use the letters of the Hebrew alphabet because I don't think you want a 22-point sermon. <laughs> But instead, I'm going to take the word woman, uh, beginning with each letter of the word, and I'll give you certain characteristics of a Messiah-like woman that you learn, that we learn from Proverbs 31. Uh, the characteristics that we want to nurture and seek out and praise and promote in women around us. So let's start with the first letter in the word woman, the letter W. Put this on the overhead. W stands for wisdom. A virtuous wife, a Messiah-like woman, is wise. And indeed, wisdom is the overarching theme of the entire book of Proverbs. So, for example, Proverbs, the whole book starts with Proverbs 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And throughout the book of Proverbs, uh, wisdom is personified as a woman. So, for example, Proverbs 1, verse 20. Wisdom cries out in the streets. In the market, she raises her voice. Or Proverbs 3, verse 13. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom, the one who gets understanding, for the gain from her is better than gain from silver, her pro her, and her profit better than gold. She's more precious than jewels. That's how the book of Proverbs begins. And it ends in the same way. The same words used for wisdom are now transferred and used for this woman, this woman of valor, this, this excellent wife. So Proverbs 31.10, an excellent wife who can find she's more precious than jewels. Again, this concept of wisdom is is related to jewels, and now this woman is related to these more precious than jewels. Uh, why? Because the end of the end of the passage tells us why. Why is she more precious than jewels? Look at the very end, Proverbs 31, 30. A woman who fears the Lord, she should be praised. And again, Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you put it together, the godly woman has Messiah-like wisdom. Why? Because she fears the Lord. She reveres the Lord. She, uh, she's humble before the Lord. She trusts the Lord. She honors the Lord. And therefore, she's wise. 
The fear of the Lord in a woman is of value beyond all else. Over and above looks and education uh, and personality and, uh, and accomplishments and likes and dislikes and all of the characteristics, a woman who fears the Lord is more precious than the finest of jewels. The time. Be this. Nurture this. Look for this. Promote this. Twice the text says, because she fears God, she's not afraid of anything else. So Proverbs 31, 21, she's not afraid of snow for her house or any threats to her household. Uh, Proverbs 31, 25, strength and dignity are her clothing. She laughs at the days to come. It's like the picture here is like Satan is trying to get her to fret all about tomorrow's troubles. But she looks up at the almighty God, whom she fears and reveres, and she laughs at Satan's folly. She's not anxious about tomorrow. She's not afraid of what's to come because she trusts completely in the Lord. So Proverbs 3, verse 5, she trusts in the Lord with all her heart. We actually sang this today. And she leads not on her own understanding. In all her ways, she acknowledges him, and she knows that he, the Lord, will make her path straight. The Messiah, that woman, fears the Lord, and therefore she, she boldly faces the future. And because she fears God, her true inward beauty will never fade. I want you to notice in this description we have here of the excellent wife, there's almost no mention at all of her physical beauty, which ironically is the one thing our secular culture exalts above everything. Our culture screams in thousands of ways every day, and the businesses spend billions of dollars in entertainment and advertising, you know, they spend countless hours to convince women that they need, well, what they need for their, their, their self-esteem and their fulfillment and their significance is all found in, in looking a certain way. But the Word of God says this, Proverbs 31, verse 30, charm is deceitful, beauty is vain and is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she should be praised. That's the beginning of wisdom and the beginning of true beauty. That's the first mark of a, of a Messiah like woman, that she's wise, which means she fears the Lord. The second letter of our acrostic of the word woman is the letter O. The Bible put this on the overhead. The Messiah like woman is an overseer of her home. Now, I use this, when I use this word, I don't mean that the woman's the head of her household, because we've seen in prior drashas, if we look at our website, ecdallas.org, God created men and women with equal dignity and equal worth, but with unique and different roles. Different roles in the home, different roles in the relationship to one another. Man and woman, husband and wife, male and female, they complement each other. And they serve one another in complementary ways. From the very beginning, even before the fall, before there was any sin that had entered the world, God created a man to be the head of his household and the woman to be his helper. Not in an inferior way, not in a domineering manner, not in any form that undercuts the value of women, but it's a compliment to one another uh, in the marriage and in the home. And God designed it this way, not as a consequence of the fall, but from the very beginning. Uh, is, 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 why? Because Ephesians 5 explains why. The whole purpose of marriage is to be a picture of Yeshua's love for us as his bride. A picture to the rest of the world. The husband is said that he's the head of the wife, just like Messiah is the head of the holy congregation. The husband loves and lays down his life for his wife. Just like Messiah loves and lays down his life for his followers. And the wife gladly submits to her husband's godly leadership in the same way that we Yeshua followers gladly submit to Yeshua's leadership. In this way, our marriages, equal in dignity, equal in, 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 in worth, but different in role, together as husband and wife, they display the goodness and the glory of Yeshua to the world. The husband or the father, in this sense, is the head of the household. He's the overseer of the home. But the Bible also emphasizes the woman's key role in the home. Uh, so for example, in Titus chapter two, Paul exhorts women to love their husbands and children and to be working in the home for their good. So look at Titus two, verse four. Women, love your husbands and children, 
be self-controlled and pure, be busy at the home, literally in the Greek it says be home workers, kind, subject to, subject to your husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. In the same way we read in 1 Timothy 5, he, uh, Paul exhorts younger women to, to manage their households. And it's the same picture we have here in Proverbs 31. This is a woman here who's a manager, who's an administrator. And in this sense, is an overseer in her home. Uh, and the home operates and flourishes as well, as well as it does because of her oversight. The woman in Proverbs 31 illustrates for us this complementary role of, of, of a woman in her home, particularly as it relates to her husband and her children. As a wife, she's a helper to her husband. And that's a picture all the way back in Genesis 2, right? It's a picture in Ephesians 5 and in Titus 2, a picture here in Proverbs 31. And note the clear priority in, in, in her life is helping her husband so that together they might glorify God. And let's read this in Proverbs 31, verse 11. The heart of her husband trusts in her. Did you hear that? He trusts her with his heart. A woman who can be trusted like this with her husband's heart indeed is far more precious than jewels. He trusts her with his heart. He trusts her also with his household. Uh, as head over his household, he entrusts her to manage and administer and oversee the house well. And she does. The whole picture here in Proverbs 31 is of a woman who oversees her house well. Her husband trusts in her, put that the on that overhead, number one with his heart, number two with his household, and number three with his good. Look at verse 11, Proverbs 31, 11. Will have no lack of gain because she does him good, not ill, all the days of her life. The Messiah-like woman does her husband good because she loves him and she loves God. She's devoted to her husband's success. Look at verse 23. Her husband's known in the gates when he sits among the Zachanim Ha'aretz, the elders of the land. The picture here is of a woman who oversees her home and helps her husband such that he has gained good standing in the community. Note that the husband is excelling. Why? Because his wife is excellent. Behind every successful man is a very good woman. <laughs> I know that's definitely true for me. Everything that I do here at EC is only possible because of the fact that, that Elizabeth is an excellent wife and mother and helpmate. So wives of all across this room, do not belittle what you do at home. Please know that your loving, selfless service as a wife and as a mother glorifies God, brings praise to Yeshua. Proverbs 31 says this virtuous wife is devoted to her husband's success and that she delights in his happiness. The text doesn't say that she carries out her role begrudgingly, but joyfully, because she's committed to her, her, her husband's good and to God's glory. And as a result, her husband trusts her with his reputation, and consequently, he honors her. Her husband loves and lays down her life for his wife's good. And as a wife, she's a helper to her husband. As a mother, she prioritizes care for her children. Throughout the scriptures, we see how God has uniquely created women for the nurture of children in a way that complements uh, the man's leadership of the children. So in Proverbs 31, we see this woman, uh, she loves her children. Uh, she provides for them. She provides clothes. She provides food. She protects them. She lays down her life for them. All these details she takes care of for them, from sun up to sun down. She takes even seemingly mundane tasks and accomplishes them when nobody else is looking, when nobody else is there to praise her or thank her for it. But the word of God promises at some point, look at verse uh, 28, her children rise up and call her blessed. This virtuous woman lives to make her children her legacy. All the days of hard work and the loving discipline and the unselfish giving are such that her children are able to stand one day, blessed to bless. I want you to listen to the words of Susanna uh, West, uh, Wesley, the mother of John and Charles Wesley. Uh, they, of course, these two sons, John and Charles Wesley, took two continents for Yeshua in America and in Europe. 
Listen to what the, their mother said, uh, Susanna Wesley. She writes this, I'm content to fill just a little space if God be glorified. No one can, without renouncing the world, observe my method. And there are few that would entirely devote above 20 years to the prime of their life in the hopes to save the souls of their children. For that was my principal intention, however unskillfully managed. Now this picture of a woman who's a, who's a homemaker and an overseer of her home, today that's being undercut and undervalued and contradicted by our secular culture. We live in a day where the idea of a woman making a home or working at home is seen as servile uh, and second class uh, and a waste of time. Or the truth be known, is there any career more important? And I'm purposely using the term career because a career is a job that requires training, preparation, commitment, dedication, on a day-to-day -day basis, bringing together various skills, energy, and time to accomplish a task. And overseeing and making a home uh, and helping a husband and raising children clearly qualifies as this, perhaps more than any other career or job. And in fact, that's one of the themes here of Proverbs 31. It seems like this woman here, she never sleeps. And that's the point. Overseeing a home is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week job. And I can't think of a career more important than overseeing a home and supporting a husband and raising and nurturing children in the Lord, all to the glory of God. I want you to listen to what this author said, Dorothy Patterson writes. We put this on the overhead as well. She writes this. Few women realize what great service they're doing for mankind and for the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, when they provide a shelter for the family and good mothering, the foundation on which all else is built. A mother builds something far more magnificent than any cathedral, the dwelling place for an immortal soul, both her child's fleshly tabernacle and his earthly abode. No professional pursuit so uniquely combines the most menial tasks with the most meaningful opportunities. Then she goes on to say this, I've never found any aging mother who believes she made a mistake of pouring her life into her children and it would be equally difficult to find a child to testify that his mother loved him and poured herself into his life to his detriment or demise. Wives and mothers of E.C. be affirmed and be honored today in the text of God's word for the management and administration and oversight that you give in the home to the glory of God. Yes. Yes. Of course, just to be clear, I am not saying I am not saying it is wrong or sinful in any way for wives or mothers to work outside the home. The scripture does not teach that. But the scripture does exhort wives and mothers not, not to neglect their home, not to neglect helping their husband and prioritizing care for their children. So let's continue on with this acrostic. W is for wisdom, O for uh, oversight, we have the overhead please, M is mighty. The virtuous wife is mighty in her work. She's strong in her work. Look at verse 17. She dresses herself with strength that makes her arms strong. Look at verse 25. Strength and dignity are her clothing. Even the form of 31, by the way, is written much like other poems are, to military heroes are written in, in, in Hebrew uh, and, and in Israel's history. And there's military imagery throughout this text. Most poems are written to recount uh, the valor and the might of, of a military hero, but this one is actually written to recount the valor and might of a strong woman. So for example, we're told this woman has willing and skillful hands. Look at verse 13. She works with willing hands. Verse 19, she puts her hand to this, this staff, her hands support and hold the spindle. She got skill in, in, saying, in, in weaving and, and spinning and providing for her children. And her love for her, her love for them, for her children, drives her labor for them. She's not lazy. Look at verse 27. She does not eat of the bread of idleness. She's got both willing and skillful hands. 
She also has an innovative and an industrious spirit. Look at verse 14. She's like merchant ships. She brings her food from afar. She arrives while it is still night and provides food for her household. She goes to great lengths to provide for her family. She's also entrepreneurial. Look at verse 16. She considers a field and buys it. The fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She doesn't, she doesn't just go to the market to buy a bunch of grapes. She buys the land and plants her own vineyard. The benefit of her house. At the same time, she's got this little cottage industry on the side going on, making linen garments, selling them, uh, delivering sashes to merchants for profit. The picture here is of a woman who's using her time and talents and gifts and the role God has given her wisely, with innovation, with an industrious spirit. Moreover, she's, she's intelligent in mind, uh, in planning and coordinating all these things. She's got a strong body. Look at verse 17. She makes her arms strong. Now, this does not mean she pumps iron in the gym. <laughs> this actually is a Hebraic idiom. Kind of like today we say, you've got a strong back. It means she's physically able to work hard. Uh, so, uh, acrostic again. W is for, uh, woman is for wise, for wisdom. The O is for oversight of her home. The M is for mighty in her work. A, she's attractive in all the right ways. As I mentioned, this text on a virtuous wife hardly even mentions her physical appearance. And when it does mention it, it does it in a kind of countercultural and unexpected way. So for example, it says she's attractive because she speaks with wisdom uh, and with kindness. Look at verse 26. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teacher with the law of kindness is on her tongue. Her words are both wise and kind. Whether it's speaking to her husband or teaching her children, she speaks with chesed, with loving kindness, with hachma, with wisdom. Um, what an attractive picture. Moreover, her works are admirable. This isn't some kind of ambiguous theoretical wisdom that she has. No, this is practical wisdom of a woman whose, well, whose own works praise her in the gates. It reminds me of 1 Timothy 2, verse 9, where Paul says, Women, adorn yourself with godliness and good works. What both the writer of Proverbs and Paul are saying is this, Be known not for what you wear or for how you look, but for how you live. Which leads to the next part of this woman's attractiveness uh, in Proverbs 31. Her dress is tasteful. Even though she's working hard all day long in different tasks and different industries with strong arms, it says she's dressed uh, in fine linen and purple. Now, this is not saying she's out there planting a vineyard in an elegant dress. It's not saying that. Nor is it saying that she wears expensive clothes. But rather, it's a picture of a woman whose dress is modest and tasteful. Most of all, her demeanor is delightful in such a way that she's attractive, particularly to her husband. The Bible is not anti-physical attraction between a husband and a wife. If we think it is, we haven't read the Song of Solomon. <laughs> so the virtuous woman in Proverbs 31, we'll put this in the overhead, her, her, her words are kind, her works are admirable, her dress is tasteful, her demeanor is delightful, and her husband is both pleased and proud. And this is like Proverbs 5, verse 18 says, he delights in the wife of his youth. So, our acrostic, the virtuous woman, is, is W is wise, O, she's an overseer of her home, M, she's mighty in her work, A, she's attractive in all the right ways, and then finally N, in the word woman, she's a neighbor to the needy. She's not selfish. She does not hoard her resources. But rather, look at verse 20. She opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. And then we see this throughout the whole book of Proverbs. Look at Proverbs 14, 31. Whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker. Or Proverbs 21, 13. Whoever closes his ears to the cry of the poor will himself call out loud and not be answered. Or Proverbs 28, 27. Whoever gives to the poor will not want, but who, he who hides his eyes will get many a curse. The Messiah-like woman gives generously from, whatever she's, from, from, from what she's made. She does not ignore the poor. 
she, and in fact, she initiates compassion. This is not a picture of the poor having to come to her. No, she goes to them. She doesn't wait for the opportunities to help the poor. She creates opportunities to help the poor. Think of the great role model that she provides for her children. She gives generously. She serves self-sacrificially. Uh, almost every verse of Proverbs 31 describes self-sacrificial service. She's doing what she's doing for the sake of those around her in need. Whether it's her husband, her children, uh, her maidens, or the poor outside her gates. This is the essence of a Messiah-like woman. Women of God, when your life is formed by Yeshua, who gave his life for you on the cross, then you'll find yourself serving as you've been served. And you'll find yourself sacrificially loving as you have been self-sacrificially loved. And in so doing, you will find life. This is the essence of the call to Yeshua, becoming like him. Luke 9, 24. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life, Yeshua said, for my sake, will find it. And this is what we see in this woman of God in Proverbs 31. In losing her life, she finds it. Women, wives, mothers of Eschheim, even if the world does not appreciate uh, that you're wise in the things of God, that you oversee your home well, that you're mighty in your work, that you're attractive in all the right ways, that you're a neighbor to the needy, nonetheless, the Lord recognizes your worth. And he gives you much fruit as your works praise you. Proverbs 31 ends like this, beginning in verse 28. Your children arise and bless you. Yes, your husband also praises you. For many women have a vast achievement, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive, and beauty is made. But a woman who fears the Lord, she should be praised. Give her the fruit of her hands. Let her works praise her. Uh, Rear on works praise her in the gates. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand and pray. And uh, let the music keep it come on up. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, today. We thank you for all the wives and mothers and women uh, of this time, Lord. We thank you for... Uh, the instruction and the exhortation and the encouragement in your word for how you want us to relate to one another uh, and how you want us to teach our children and run our households all to your glory. Help all the women here to see Proverbs 31 as a great role model to be studied of a godly woman. Help the husbands to love and encourage and lay down their lives for their wives. Help a single man here look uh, for these Messiah-like traits in a future wife. We thank you, Lord Yeshua, for, for, God, for the godly wisdom that you have given to the women here. Help them always to remember that the beginning of wisdom is to fear you. Help them to resist the anti-biblical, ultra-feminist pressures of our secular world that want to erase all the differences and all the, uh, the roles between men and women, male and female. Help each wife and, and mother here to oversee her home well, and to care and nurture and train her children to love and to serve and to follow you with all their hearts and minds and soul and strength and resources. Thank you, Lord, today for the strength and the gifts and the talents you've given to every woman here at Esheim. Help us all to focus on the inward beauty and attractiveness that you, Lord, value most. Wisdom, kindness, gentleness, humility, servant, love, long-suffering, self-control. And help us to be, be a neighbor to the needy, uh, reaching out with compassion to the poor and the sick and the unemployed and the elderly and the disabled. So we thank you for this great picture of a godly woman. And we look to, to your cross uh, to make everything new in Yeshua's name. Shabbat shalom.